Uh, my name is Ozren, and uh, just like Yuri said, I come from this long, long title of places, but basically just medical school, very close to this place. Um, as you can see, the topic of today's talk is how to build a biobank. Uh, I don't know if you have any more uh, lectures on the side of data and samples collection. I think that you'll be focused more on analysis. Uh, so just for you to have an idea that the data that you'll be using must come from somewhere. OK, firstly, let's just try to see. Uh, just a brief overview of what I'm about to talk about. First of all, we'll uh, just run through some basic stuff in genetics. Uh, I'll provide you with a brief overview of biobanking, tell you a bit about 10,001 Dalmatians Biobank, and then I'll tell you something about future developments of our biobank and possibly some others as well. Uh, I'm sure that you're all aware that uh, the Human Genome Project was the biggest thing that happened in genetics uh, in the past decade and it was completed by 2001. It provided the first human complete sequence. It took about 10 years and about 100 million dollars to uh, develop this one sequence and at that time everybody thought okay now we know human sequence will be able to do something like this. Take a look in somebody's DNA and then forget stethoscopes and forget everything that medicine knew about everything, we'll just be fixing everything with genes. Did it happen? Mm. Well, now we are almost 15 years away from that. Have any of you had gene therapy? No? Oops. Why? Why genetics didn't change the world yet? Well, first of all, we've realized that genomes are very, very complex. Uh, secondly, it's quite costly to uh, analyze somebody's genome. Then there are difficulties in definition of our phenotypes. Then there are problems with epigenetics and, of course, problems with people. But you're all aware of problems with people. Uh, just briefly, what do these people have in common? Is their DNA similar? To what extent? About 98% of their complete DNA sequence is the same just as well for us, all of us here. It means that we are different from one another in only small, small parts of our DNA. Now comes the bad part. My genetic material is closer to male chimp than to my wife. <laughs> and one more interesting thing, we're sharing about 60% of our active genes with bananas. So it should be easy to find genes, right? Mm. First of all, we're dealing with a lot of data. Uh, well, in terms of when you, ask the, when you talk to physicians, then they say 3 times 10 to the power of 9 base pairs. Well, it's not such a huge amount of data, but it actually is a lot of data. Uh, and it's expected that about 25,000 genes are present in our genome. But the problem is that some genes behave in classical Mendelian uh, fashion. Uh, I don't know how many of you are biologists. How far do I need to go into these explanations? OK, just briefly. Mendelian genetics says one gene, one disease. Very simple. But there are polygenic diseases where more genes are affecting one trait or one disease. Then there are interactions between different genes that we are still kind of trying to figure out. Then we've recently started working in genetic networks and pathways and of course various compensatory mechanisms and the problem is that evolution can provide you with a number of possible solutions for any kind of problem. Imagine one bacteria that has one DNA and only lives in one environment. Everything is perfect and then you introduce something new, for example ultraviolet, li ultraviolet light. And then ultraviolet light will kill off most of bacteria but some will remain. And they will develop some kind of mechanisms, God knows what kind of mechanisms, by changing lichens, by changing DNA, by providing more enzymes, just about anything. And they will manage to withstand and evolve to something else. And in the end, you get a huge array of possible solutions to different kind of environmental problems. So what can we do in these situations? We can use better genetic markers, more markers and more subjects. 
uh, I gather that what from from what Yuri was saying that you were already discussing that th things need to be bigger and bigger. So more markers, more subjects. Then complete sequences can be used, which is also falling into this category. More markers, then you can include epigenetics, better analytic tools. That's what you're here about. And then you can use special models and conditions such as human isolated populations, trios and various other study designs. Second important problem is cost. Uh, like I said, it costed about 100 uh, million US dollars to produce first sequence. And there is actually this thing called Moore's law that says that the cost of sequencing will be dropping down seriously. Well, it's dropping even more down and currently it's in the range of $10,000. Well, some companies are claiming that it's way, way more cheaper, including the lowest one, $3,500 for one sequence. But I don't know if any of you have heard that they are functional or they're just uh, proclaiming that they can do it. Third problem why uh, we are not seeing huge developments is that we're having difficulties in defining of our phenotypes. It sounds quite easy, right? You have a disease and you go find the gene for it. Well, the problem is that many diseases occur as a result of numerous reasons. For example, if you look into myocardial infarction, it can be caused by embolus, which is something that blocks the blood flow through your vessel. And it can be caused by either blood cloth, by air bubble, by some parasites. Then atherosclerosis also causes myocardial infarction. Then hyperlipidemia, elevated lipids in your blood, lack of physical activity, smoking, salt overuse, chemical injury, they all end up producing the same outcome, which is basically a part of your muscle dying off. So the idea was, firstly, clinicians thought, we'll just take these people who have myocardial infarctions and compare them to healthy ones who haven't got the infarction, and we'll see if there are genes that differentiate these two groups. Apparently, this idea most commonly failed. And new idea was developed that we shouldn't be looking for the disease, but we should be looking for quantitative traits that underlie this disease. So instead of going from DNA to the disease, it's way better to think about the DNA that produces some kind of protein. This protein builds up uh, normal heart tissue and then trying to link this information with, uh, disease, with disease in the end. So this stepwise approach definitely made our life easier because it was way more easy to find a gene that encodes some kind of protein and protein that builds up heart and then trying to find the link with the disease than going in the direct line which usually failed. Um, will you have a lecture on heritability? Mm, not really. Not really. One of the main things whenever you are talking about quantitative genetics and Yuri will most certainly know more but just to give you a short uh, overview and an idea is uh, something that is called heritability. Uh, the idea is that it's way better to select a trait that is uh, that has genetic component uh, compared to the ones that have stronger environmental component. So if you take a look into, for example, three members of one family and compare them to just about any other person in the population, if you see that similarity in some kind of trait is way greater than these family members compared to any random member of the population, you can see that some traits are kind of grouping in the family. And if they are grouping in the family, in the broadest possible sense, uh, you can say that these uh, traits are more heritable, meaning that there is a stronger genetic component to them. Of course, things get way more complicated is the, because the fact is that these people are kind of living in the same location. They share some household environment. So it's not as easy, but the general idea is that you can select traits that are very heritable and first try to find genes for them. So, in order to maximize the possibility of finding a gene, you need to select a stable and very heritable trait and use the huge, huge, huge sample size. The, one of the best examples and uh, probably one of the most interesting quantitative traits, height. It tends to be quite stable once you reach your final height. That's basically it. You can lose some height because of osteoporosis or poor stature, but basically it's there once you've grown. And it, it has heritability in the range between 85 to 95% depending on the study, meaning that 
we can attribute at least 90% of variance in height to our genes. So in, two, uh, in 2010, a paper got published by Nature, which uh, provided the results of the analysis from one large consortium, which included over 200 institutions, 130,000 subjects in the discovery cohort, and 85,000 in the replication cohort, 60, sorry, but a bit more in the replication, 263 authors. Main result, 130 new genes were found, but these genes explained just about 7% of variance. So mathematicians among you will ask, okay, where is the remaining 93% of variance? Can we do something with this genetic information? You can say, okay, if I know your genome, I can predict, predict about 7% of your height, meaning that my imprecision will be that your height is between 150 and 240 probably, so it's nearly useless information. What's more depressing is that if you use this information with, uh, from this study and try to project, uh, you'll see that it will require about 700 different loci, meaning 700 different genes in sample size of about half a million people to explain just 15% of variance. And this is a serious problem if you're trying to use genetics properly and trying to predict somebody's uh, health or somebody's even height. Uh, and it has been termed as the missing heritability, meaning that we have very high estimates of heritability suggesting that there is strong genetic component, but we cannot find this exact causative uh, genetic background that causes this. So when you think about traits and diseases, there are four different things that you can use. Uh, first of all, a gene can cause some kind of disease. Secondly, an environmental condition can cause some kind of disease. Can you come up with one disease that is purely environmental? Something that can happen to you that has nothing to do with genes? Asbestosis. Asbestosis, Asbestosis. excellent. Any more ideas? Radioactivity. Radioactivity, right. Else? Sunburns, excellent. No, 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 we, we, we're just compiling ideas. So we have sunburns, radioactivity, and asbestosis. When you touch that, that quite a lot of environmental stuff. I know there is quite a lot of genetic too, but... Okay, newsflash. There are almost no purely environmental diseases. There is one single possible exception to that. And that's basically trauma. Somebody hits you with a car. <laughs> you had nothing to do with it. Just about everything else, sunburns, radioactivity, asbestosis, has genetic basis to it. Sunburns, if you have darker skin, you won't get them as easy. If you have very, very uh, soft and light skin, you just need to put your arm out <laughs> and basically you might end up with sunburn. Uh, asbestosis, now we know that there are genetic components to cancer, uh, we still can predict them quite well, but some people can be exposed to huge amounts of just about any kind of exposure and not develop a disease, others develop it quite fast. So um, currently we think that environment is very important, but that almost no disease is purely environmental. Uh, whenever you think about, well, there are discussions uh, about trauma and uh, genetic basis, and somebody said that uh, people who get uh, broken legs and who are jumping, base jumping or parachuting or whatever, they might have genetic uh, uh, tendency to being more uh, interested in adrenaline sports and still you have a genetic component even to such thing as trauma. So it's, it's well, I if anything, it's way more complex than what you thought and what the, than what you were taught in your school just as I was. But We'll come to that across this thing as well. Third important, thing is, uh, third important thing is that uh, now we know that a lot of genes do interact with environment. And this thing can make things a bit more complicated because uh, interaction can go both ways and you simply um, have difficulties in defining which is more important and how they interact. And of course, at the end, Anything that we can't fit into these categories, we just tend to call it random effects. 
uh, being it true random that something happens really randomly or something that we can't completely understand and we just add another random component to it. We've already discussed about environment. Can you design, can you think of a study that completely excludes environmental effects on human beings? Can you be completely separate from your environment? Is this guy completely separate from his environment? Hmm? He's got his own life support. Uh, he's protected from radiation. He's got his oxygen pack. Is this environment affecting him at all? Anything around you. <laughs> so basically, he's, he depends on his environment. Since his environment is his suit. Okay. Uh, is the moon, lunar environment affecting this guy? Yes. How? Gravity. Gravity. Even if you try to shield yourself from just about anything, uh, lack of proper gravity will mean that your muscles will tend to atrophy. And uh, by the time that you get to Earth, you'll basically be a squid and you'll require some rehabilitation to be able just to walk. So there is no way that we can cut out environment. You may also be depressed with landscape. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the darkness. <laughs> yeah, so we, we can't cut out environment. Can we do something more interesting and try to find something a bit more about genetics? One example, twin studies. In biological terms, twins are clones, right? Well, modern genetics uh, thinks that twins are clones at the time of conception. And everything afterwards, they're just very, very, very much alike, but they tend to have their own mutations and along the way they will have a sl slight and subtle differences from one another and they will no longer be exact clones, but they are quite useful for a number of possible studies ranging from heritability onwards because uh, they are very, very alike. Family studies, these are, well, actually they were quite popular in the past um, where simply you would try to find some trait or some disease that runs in a family and then try to do study that finds a gene for this. Lately, uh, we are more and more focused on huge sample sizes, but still uh, some things are way better uh, discovered in such smaller family studies. And lastly, you can use special populations. And the reason why I'm here is that I'll tell you something about one of these special populations. But no matter which design you're using, you will probably end up with developing a biobank. Some of the, well, basically the definition of a biobank is that it's a depository of biological samples. Most commonly, uh, these are blood samples and serum or plasma samples, but the extent of various biobanks ranges from almost, it includes basically all human tissues, uh, depending on the research question that you're asking. Uh, can you come up with idea, what's this? Hmm? Seat back. Hmm? Some other ideas? A robot that collects samples. A robot that collects samples. This is a Danish biobank. It contains over, uh, over 520,000 samples. And this is basically one huge, gigantic freezer. And they have automated robot that goes from this address, takes a sample, and goes back and provides you with a set of samples. Where so. Uh, from the freezer. No, 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 but where is this, this freezer? Uh, this freezer, uh, I think it, it's custom made. It's just, I, I think that uh, they have a square uh, surface area of about 350 square meters that are basically engulfed and this, it's all basically one big freezer. Very, very big. I'm um, just curious, Which where, institution? where, where do you oh. have that many samples? Uh, I think it's currently at the University of Copenhagen, but I'm not certain. Most likely them. I don't know if there is any bigger uh, uh, institution, but I don't know where physically it's located. <laughs> currently, uh, the estimations are that about 
11.5 million of subjects were biobanked by 2010 and about 4 million subjects ever since. So it's at least, uh, biobanks currently have at least 15 million people uh, that are all uh, involved in various consortia that uh, are trying to manage biobanks such as BBMRI, which is the largest European uh, biobanking and molecular research infrastructure. Uh, and P3G is just one uh, organization that tries to assemble all the information on biobanks and provide some kind of uh, links between them. Many countries have national biobanking hubs and two biggest names uh, in the business are UK Biobank and Kaduri Biobank in China uh, that all have, uh, both have about half of million of samples. Uh, in terms of UK Biobank, they've just started uh, doing some genotyping and they're basically developing a biobank that will be used for a number of possible studies and they have recently announced that they will allow access to both data and samples for researchers interested in this. So basically biobanks are really, really uh, big and growing. And the reason why this one is mentioned here, it's called FinRisk. There is also a huge data set uh, apparently from Finland and they have excellent follow-up data. So for most of their subjects, they've, they've already been following up their health for the past 20 years and they have an excellent data source for different kinds of possible outcomes in these people. And then we come to 10,001 donations, which is just like Yuri said, another example of biobank. Uh, but this biobank is focused on isolated human populations. And basically we are trying to sample people from the Adriatic Islands in Croatia. Uh, why? Firstly, because they have reduced environmental diversity. If you're living in a big city, then you can be exposed to different environments, different lifestyles. And if you're living on a small piece of land somewhere in the sea, it's very likely that you will have much more reduced environmental diversity and you will be exposed to similar lifestyle. But what's even more important is that these people have reduced genetic diversity through two different mechanisms. The first one is founder effect. And basically the founder effect says that genetic profile of modern day population depends heavily on the founders, people who first came on the island and settled there. So if they brought in some kind of rare variant or rare uh, disease in the population, over time this disease could have become much more frequent in the population and it's way easier to find a gene that causes it. The other thing is genetic drift, which basically tells you that if you have a small and isolated population, you have way greater chances of one gene becoming very, very frequent or completely uh, being lost from the population. And this also can have positive effects on uh, odds of finding a gene for any kind of disease. So, this project was initiated in 2001 uh, based on this isolation idea. At the moment we have, uh, we've reached only four and a half thousand genotype samples and we have funds to include additional 2000. Currently we have a freezer farm that contains about 137,000 aliquots of serum, plasma and urine and we are having serious problems where to put it because it's stored in six huge freezers each one weighs about 450 kilograms and you need to put them all in air-conditioned room. So currently at the middle of medical school we have, at the third floor, we have huge statical problems uh, because it's three tons that are placed in big, in room that is, well, this big. Uh, and now we need to expand it further and we have no idea how to do it physically. So it, it can be filled with, well, this line of work can be filled with different problems that you don't know how to solve. <coughs> the samples originate from various islands, including Susa, Krab, Vis, Lastovo and Ljet, which were the smaller islands. And then in Vis, we recruited 1,000 people and in Korčula currently th uh, almost 3,000 and in City of Split as well, 1,000. So uh, this biobank is growing. Uh, the latest work uh, this year and the past one we were on the island of Korčula, which has two large uh, tourist locations and several smaller islands in the inlands of the island. Well, these smaller islands are, uh, small, uh, sorry, smaller villages. 
they are much more interesting to us than the, the ones that have a view and the sea. And these are the highland villages in the inside. You see that there is no view to the sea. They're basically living in the highlands. Can you think of a reason why would somebody not want to see view? But you would just tend to find a place where you have one mountain on one side and the other on the other side, and then you tend to live here in the valley. Close, very close. Just let's be politically and ethically correct and not <laughs> go with the Italians and go with pirates. <laughs> the idea is that if you're living in 16th or 17th century and you want to have a view, it's beautiful, but then also the pirates at the sea have a view of you and then you have a problem. So most of these villages are built on the inner part so that nothing comes out over the ridge and you're basically invisible to the pirates that are roaming on the sea. Um, in terms of phenotyping, we tried to do as many things as we could and for the most densely phenotyped uh, group of people that come from the island of Vis, we have about 1,300 different traits measured from serum, plasma, urine and direct measurements. Uh, we took samples of blood and urine. We also measured the number of uh, things that we could, including digital ECG, uh, blood elasticity, central blood pressures, uh, retinal uh, photo that basically looks like this. Do you think it's interesting photo to have it or no? <laughs> this is the only place in human body where you can see blood vessels that are not covered with skin. All other places you can't see anything because there is skin. And if you want to look into blood vessels, this is the best possible place that you can do it. There are also different spots here that can be used and currently we're uh, performing a study that tries to measure uh, the angles of branching and number of branches and try to link it with the problems that occur in diabetes or atherosclerosis and so far it sounds quite promising. And now just a quick list of uh, measurements. Conventionally, we did anthropometry, including some basic stuff, height, weight, circumferences, blood pressure, spirometry, which is function of lungs, bone mineral density, retinal fundus, different eye measurements, some thresholds, and I'll tell you a bit about it later. And then we have this set of papers with about 550 questions that we hand out to people and tell them, could you please fill this out? Uh, and at first we would simply invite people to come in and they would sit down and write this and it would take for ages. And last year we realized that we can do something way better and we printed these out and handed them to people before they came. And told them do it at home, try to fill it out, provide us with as much as information as you can and then they would come and be measured and it sounds way, way better. We're not keeping them in the facility for four and a half to five hours that used to be, but only for one and a half to two hours, and they're happier. Did you get increased dropout rate when you switched? <laughs> so people see this and they decide never to come? Um, this is a great question. Um, dropouts, um, well, it depends in which stage of the work you are. When first, Whenever we come to a village on the first place, we get huge interest in this. And then about at least 50 people approach us who want to see what's happening with them. These 50 people are usually the most difficult, boring sons of a <laughs> that exist in the world. <laughs> and they tend to kill off all enthusiasm by asking, oh, this hurts. Oh, I have this. I have what do I do? And, what do I and it hurts. And but they are the ones who will be there first and we need to deal with them. Then comes the second part, when you are dealing with people who are genuinely interested in their health. And they're, they're basically the best. And usually these two stages use up about a third of, of population. Then there is second third of population that you can try to invite and do all kinds of crazy things that I'll tell you a bit about it later. And then there is the last third that there is no way that you can get them 
to be examined and measured. We'll this talk. Uh, well, since most of people in the last third are men and gender is genetically defined, yes. Oh, right. <laughs> so it's actually very strong predictor. Very, very strong predictor. <laughs> there is no way that you can attract young, healthy men to be examined. Because whenever you ask them, do you think your health is important? Yes, but I'm healthy. I don't need anything. But you might need it in the future when you become less healthy. Oh, who cares? Then I'll come when I'm less healthy. But it's very important for us to have a clear picture of the health on the island. Yeah, but there's plenty of people coming. You've got all the elderly ones, all the retired. There is no way that you can get young men to participate. In terms of molecular measurements, we did genotyping for all of these people. Uh, these were the ones that were used in the past and now we've used quad with a bit more markers. Uh, we also have exome sequencing for 300 people at the moment and funding to do another thousand. You'll hear a bit about glycom. We also have measures of lipids, various lipid fractions, which is another sad story uh, because this number 347 was originally meant to be over 1,200 different uh, traits. We ended up with data for just this small fraction, but still it's interesting. And recently we've started working uh, quite a lot on urine traits and some preliminary results are quite promising as well. Hmm. Yeah. So what does it look like in reality? Uh, you take almost $2 million worth of equipment and you put it on this very narrow track. Can this be brightened a bit? No. Um, unfortunately, I'm sorry that you can't see it better. This is the width of the road. And you basically put all the equipment to this track and uh, try to get to one of these islands in the central parts of the, uh, of the island, village, and then you need a place to put all this equipment somewhere to have this done. And in the last one that we were at, we got this abandoned store uh, that wasn't used for the past 10 years. And they simply said, well, that's the only place that you can use to put all this equipment and to have people invited. And you can use it for free if you clean it. And you can see the freezer, actually, the cool box for salami and completely expired and out of date drinks. It was horrible. But uh, uh, in, in terms to boost team's morale, you have to be the first one who will take on the worst jobs possible, including cleaning of old, very old toilets. But when you clean it, you can establish a lab and this is basically the most basic lab that you can come up with. This is our portable minus 80 freezer and the desk with huge number of tubes for aliquoting, centrifuge and basically we were ready to go. And then comes the sentence where I completely envy all the people who are investigating mice and cells because you simply take them cut them, slice them, dice them, <laughs> do whatever you can with people. <laughs> it's very, very difficult. Imagine these four guys and try to approach them and persuade them to be examined. <laughs> it can be quite demanding, just as we said uh, way back. Uh, the problem is that some of them are just problematic. And you wouldn't believe who causes the most problems on, on these islands? And the answer is doctors. Hmm. Doctors hate us. In 2007, uh, we sampled first 100 people from the island of Korchula. Uh, I got the results from the lab and in 100 of them, 94 had very high levels of cholesterol. And I thought, I'm not going to send out these results. And I stopped it for a week, for two weeks, and then my team says, well, you can't do it. 
you promised to send these results to the people, you have to send them off. And we packed them and sent off the results. Next day, instead of 12 people who were invited to be examined, we got three. Day after, zero. What happened? When these results came to the people, they immediately went to their doctor and said, what kind of a doctor are you? Because these guys come here and show me that I'm sick. And you never even told me, you never even bothered to see what my lipids are. And the doctor takes the first patient and says, oh, oh yeah, yeah, we'll check your lipids. And the second one, oh yeah, yeah we'll check it and we'll give you, and third one, hmm, hmm, they are lying. And immediately everything stops. Because it's a small community, whenever somebody says they're lying, it's not true, boom, everything stops. So what could we do? So in a way you actually like challenge the authority, right? When you come to the place where you die, you should yourself in top authority and then you kind of provide alternatives, which is I in imagine it's very, very challenging. In 2011, we had a lady who came to us. We recorded her ECG, and the ECG said acute infarction. Immediately, we took her to her GP, to her physician, and the guy says, oh, you're here again. Uh, what? Well, she's been complaining about this pain for like weeks, for, for almost two months. But you know, I, I know her. It's just, hello, it's not nothing. <laughs> it's infarction. Ah, um, okay, well, you know what? If it goes on for like a day or two, then come back and we'll send you. What? Hello? <laughs> you need to send her to the hospital now. We had to argue with him for her to be sent to the hospital. And that's a real problem. These people are just living in their slow lives, thinking that they know everybody's health. Oh, she's okay, she's just imagining things. Yeah, and we are challenging them. So in order to get these people to approach us, first of all, we tried to send in postal invitations. So we just took the list of everybody who was living on the island and sent off the invitations. And then we also got a new enemy on the island. And it was a postman. <laughs> because we would print it off thousand and a half invitations and he came one day with the bag and threw it in front of me and said, you sent off one and a half thousand invitations, and I'm giving you back one thousand. Um, excuse me, but these were paid. <laughs> you were supposed to deliver them. Yes, but you were supposed to know that these people don't live on the island, that these are phony addresses, and I just don't have to. Uh, I can't deliver them because there are no boxes, because these addresses don't even exist. Oh, shoot. <laughs> okay, then we tried phone contacts. Like this. Firstly, you got uh, the number 020733, and then you start 001. Hello, would you like to be 002? Would you like to be? Well, it worked to some degree, uh, but it wasn't very functional. Then we started having leaflets and walking around the place and giving the leaflets to people, and then you would give them a leaflet and they would say, oh, I get to be examined here on the island, everything, yes. And it's for free. Oh, why is it for free? <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> then talking to mayor and to the few physicians that were still not angry at us. Nah. Then going to the radio also turned out to be bogus, nothing, false newspapers. And then <clears throat> would you think that we've used up all of our resources? Is there a solution to this? Hmm? <laughs> we approached the priest and said we're having difficulties, these people are not interested in what we're doing and you should have seen the Sunday Mass. <laughs> what kind of people are you? No. <laughs> Somebody needs to come here and knock on your door and pull your hand and you still don't want to be examined. What do you expect? Can I heal you? <laughs> Go there and <laughs> people overrun us. We were designed to do 12 people a day. After this guy, we were doing about 20, meaning that my team was shattered. <laughs> they didn't eat or sleep. 
but we ended up working like crazy. And then, of course, the time comes. Church. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had moral dilemmas with that thing uh, because it, I don't know, it sounded some kind of too invasively for me. I mean, your religion is something quite intimate. But after all this, I had no other <laughs> means. Yeah, in, in, in 16th century, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, it worked. Then comes the time when you need to pack everything back on the truck and head on to the next village. And for example, in this one, we were using the abandoned dancing hall uh, that was later used to store chairs. And here you see one small boat and some bicycles. And then you try to use up all the space that you can, you put on your minus 80 freezer and you prepare a desk for blood to be taken. You prepare the rooms and the ECGs and everything. And then of course, when your freezer is filled with samples and just about to go to split, then the freezer suddenly starts to do and you're looking at your temperature, minus 80, minus 79.5, minus 79, <laughs> 78.5, and thinking, oh shit. <laughs> Luckily, we managed to find ice cream maker on the island who could produce dry ice from CO2. And we completely uh, put the freezer down, opened it, filled it with dry ice, and immediately carried it off to the boat, uh, to the ferry. And the guys at the ferry were saying, why do you have an emergency? We're having a freezer that's melting down. But, oh, it can't melt down just like that. Yeah, but you don't know it's at minus 80. <laughs> you need to ship it off immediately. And luckily, uh, we managed to save the freezer because the temperature never went above minus 64. So samples were still fine. Uh, some kind of theoretical limit is that your samples shouldn't ever touch minus 40. Uh, the second that they go to higher temperature than minus 40, then the samples are kind of questioned. Uh, we did a number of uh, controls. You can check for various metabolites and the degree of decay between them, and samples are quite fine. Uh, but it just shows you that it's occasionally quite difficult to get the samples to where you want them to be. Uh, either by approaching the people or actually uh, being able to get the samples of good quality to the lab to do some analysis. Does it make sense, all this effort? Yes. These are uh, the papers in past three years where we had uh, joined the analysis and you can see that it's quite, quite productive. Uh, the idea is that most biobanks today are uh, joined in consortia, meaning that there is a wider group of people and then somebody says uh, or demonstrates that they are able to analyze some trait and then they say all the groups that have this trait, they can do analysis, we'll just send you the protocols, you'll do uh, what we have to do, what you have to do and then we'll do some meta-analysis and then it's quite easy to go to big impact journals uh, because of the sample size and almost global context that, uh, context that you managed to do your study at. Uh, in 2013, there was an interesting study that says that we are able to predict somebody's educational attainment from genes. I was the one who was laughing out loud when somebody first dropped this idea saying, let's see whether we can find a gene for educational attainment. Well we ended up with one significant hit that was very close to a gene that is supposed to be involved in intelligence. But then again, there is a problem of that thing, missing heritability. This gene explains about 2% of variance in your education, which means that it tells you whether you will have education that will last for two, two more months or less. So effect of one gene is just uh, whether you will be in school for two months, which sounds funny, but definitely tells you that it's possible to find something as fancy as this. All these papers mean that 
this is one of the rare lists, positive lists in, Cro in the world where Croatia is listed uh, on, the, on this side of the scale and we've been ranked as 20th country in the world according to the use of GWAS data which is quite interesting. Okay. You can get the PowerPoint, it's e easier. <laughs> uh, in terms of ongoing initiatives, we've just started developing in various, various directions. One of the most interesting ones is population genetics, where we're currently performing a study of the Balkan population and trying to see who is genetically similar to whom. This has serious political problems and connotations as well because we're basically showing no no difference between Croats and Serbs and minuscule, minuscule, negligible difference between Croats and Bosniaks and Bosniak and Serbs. Basically saying that it's all the same population. And it all started off with us trying to predict uh, membership to different villages on the island. And this can be done fairly easily with a set of only 7,000 markers. You can say that somebody comes from vill village Račišće or Lumbarda or Žrnovo and it's amazing that it takes such a small amount of information to say where somebody comes from. Second interesting initiative is that we are working quite strongly on inbreeding and uh, this thing, Rohgin, is a consortium of uh, various biobanks and we've assembled it trying to see whether we can find uh, traces of inbreeding or effects of inbreeding on 16 quantitative traits. Uh, we ended up having huge sample size with 346,000 subjects for height and uh, we're just drafting this paper and it should be submitted soon. Then we've developed uh, two omics lines uh, that we're joking that they're called sense omics where we're asking people uh, and measuring pain threshold and pain tolerance, hearing threshold, taste threshold, smell threshold and various cognitive tests where we're trying to see how people respond to various stimuli. Uh, can you think of how would you test somebody's pain threshold? Electricity. Hmm? Electricity. Electricity. <laughs> okay, other ideas? <laughs> <laughs> we have this device that is called algometer, which is basically inverse dynamometer. You simply ask somebody to put their hand on the table and you press one finger and you read out the amount of force that you applied to a finger. And when before the person... They, before, they, before what happened? <laughs> you, firstly, you ask them to respond whenever they start feeling a pain. It's quite difficult actually to find it. And then you do several testings just to let them know what they're expecting. And different spots in your body? No, just one. On the same? Yeah, we, we go uh, just one on the finger, left, right, uh, left hand and right hand, uh, we do just index fingers. Uh, different places in the body introduce more complexity in analysis. We try to focus on the middle phalanx of the finger. But the idea is that sometimes it's quite difficult to say when the pain starts. You feel something, then you feel discomfort, and then you feel the pain. That's pain threshold. What's pain tolerance? Say that it's mainly pain perception. It's pain perception. Mm -hmm. And what's pain tolerance? Pain tolerance is basically, you tell them, you see, now you've said it's pain. Now let's see how far you can withstand for the pain to be present. And of course we have a cutoff because there are just people who <laughs> tolerate pain. And the problem is that the more you press, there is a greater chance of the device slipping and then causing some proper damage. So at some point we tend to cut off uh, the measurement. Taste threshold. This is hmm? four, four basic, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. So we give them... No, we don't do umami. Nobody knows what umami is. We, we, well, some of you do, but imagine people on the island living and being 50, 60 years of age. They have no clue what umami is. We, we even don't have a word for it in creation. Nobody has. <laughs> Yeah, the idea is that you take six concentrations, progressive concentrations, and you ask people to try 
First one, what's that? Oh, water. Second, water. Third, uh, I don't know, something. Try again, it's salty. And then you get somebody's threshold. We also do smell recognition where you have, uh, there is a company that produces pens that are filled with smell. And then you simply open a pen, put it in, in front of somebody's nose, they smell it, and they, then they say, oh, it's pineapple or something. And you then, also have different smells? Uh, we have a set of 16 smells. 16. Yeah, and then you do two passes. In first pass, you ask them, what's that? Can you say or no? Uh, and in second pass, you offer four possibilities. Mm -hmm. And then you say, S choose one of these four. And in the end, you get something that is almost quantitative, quantitative variable uh, based on these things. And this last thing is cognitive tests. And we've just started working on that. And it's very, very promising. Uh, you have basically a plate that asks you to respond and click with your right hand or left foot or something, uh, join two dots or a number of things. And it produces about 120 different outputs of cognitive variables and we'll just start How much time? Uh, in actually quite short time. It takes about eight to 10 minutes per person to do it. And you get uh, speed of reaction, latency. You can actually measure uh, from the ratio of hand and foot reaction, you can measure somebody's uh, interest in performing this exercise. Uh, <laughs> that's very important. Uh, We've started another set of omics things, and we call it anthropomics, where we're trying to measure people. And we've just bought 3D body scanner uh, that consists of six lasers, where you simply stand in it, and in two seconds it measures, I think, 187 different measures of a body, including uh, arm length, foot length, uh, body size, torso, things and such. Uh, we've also bought uh, 3D camera for facial scans, and we already performed first 100 uh, cone beam, cone beam computed tomography scans, which are these that basically uh, record all your teeth and bony structures of your face. Uh, so we are developing big, big base uh, of possible anthropometrical analysis. Also, we're working on global dimension as well. And we've just recently started working with the Amanhi Biobank, which aims to collect newborns, mothers, and fathers from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Tanzania, and soon to join China, Mexico, and Sri Lanka. The idea is that you can do a biobank of uh, maternals and newborns and fathers and try to see whether you can predict some diseases, uh, including uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes and things like that. And people here will be in, we sampling blood and urine and feces of mother, uh, core blood, placenta tissue, placenta membranes, uh, feces of the baby, and saliva of father, trying to develop very, very big biobank as well. One thing that we have started being involved in the past year is that we have also started uh, with infectious diseases. And that's amazing that for a fair amount of infectious diseases, now we know that there are genes that predispose you whether you'll get the disease or not. And here is the result for tuberculosis. It's one meta-analysis of, I think, 22 studies involved uh, that basically shows you that a gene uh, called NRAMP1 is an important genetic predictor of whether you'll get tuberculosis or no. So it's not that you just simply stand in front of somebody and somebody spits on you, uh, it seems that your genetics will also define whether uh, after being spot, sp spot on, uh, you'll develop tuberculosis or no. And lastly, uh, we've also started working with ancient DNA samples. Uh, there are human remains on the island of Korčula from Vela Spilja that are between three and 9,000 years old. And we've started working on, uh, at the moment, mitochondrial DNA. Uh, but we're hoping that we'll be able to extract a bit more information, then in the end be able to compare the ancient samples with the modern day population, uh, which will ex explain to us some of the population genetics. Excuse me, how many individuals are there? Here. Yeah. You wouldn't believe it. Uh, six adults, uh, four kids, and three fetuses in just one part of the cave. 
and there are still two large parts of the cave that hadn't been even dug up. Uh, the thing is that this cave has very acid soil and uh, this acidity preserved bones to incredible degree and we are able, we were able to extract uh, even DNA from two of those skeletons. So it's also quite interesting. Of course a number of people are involved in this uh, who are not here but I have to mention them. Uh, including the ones who are involved in cleaning or taking blood. Well, if it's not working with the arm, then you need to have people who are crazy enough to take the blood from somebody's leg. And of course, the ones who are finding the money for all of this to be funded. And of course, a number of sponsors to whom we also thank. <laughs> and that's basically it. Thank you.